Happy Sabbath, Lehi family. I'm so grateful that the Lord has brought us to this point of corporate worship once again on this his Sabbath day. Because he has brought us through a week that I'm sure has been very difficult for many. But we can just thank the Lord because he's a protector. He's our guide. He loves us so much that he desires nothing but to have us come together in his presence this morning and just to lift up his mighty name. If you're joining us for the first time, I want to say a special Lehi welcome to you. I want to say that on behalf of our entire church, our members, our leadership, and our pastor, Dr. Newton Hoyland. You will experience a COVID flip, a special COVID flip today, because that's what our pastor does each and every week. He flips COVID and he finds a brighter side. So I hope that you will experience the brighter side of COVID today if you haven't experienced that before. We're so grateful to Pastor for continuing to flip COVID and thanking the Lord how he has, he, has, he has enabled him to do so Sabbath after Sabbath. Please stay with us because we need to get to the message today. So as we pray together, as we sing together, and as we listen to our children's story, we will be mindful that Pastor has another message for us. Oh, Pastor, he, he began a mini-series about three weeks ago called Going Home. And we've heard about closing up shop. We've had a wake-up call. And today, Pastor will remind us that it is high time. These are critical messages for a critical time. So I pray that we will approach with attentive ears as Pastor brings us the message from, from the Word of God today. I want to just say, continue to give your tithes and your offerings by way of our website online. You will see the instructions right after this welcome. I want to thank you. I, I have to thank you each and every Sabbath for how you support the mission of the Lehigh Seventh-day Adventist Church even in these difficult times with your free will offerings. It is so great to get together with the family once again to worship God. Let us worship him today in spirit and in truth. Once again, happy Sabbath and welcome each and every one. It's another first ever for Lehigh SDA Church. It's our first virtual annual Thanksgiving offering. In spite of everything going on around us, global pandemic among others, we have so much to be thankful for. What are you thankful for? Greetings Lehigh SDA Church, all the way from the Bahamas. Happy Thanksgiving. During this time, I'm very thankful to God this year for keeping me safe during this time and for keeping my family safe as well. I'm thankful for life, family, and friends. I'm thankful for is one that most of our churches here in Jamaica remained open during the COVID-19. And two, I am thankful for Jamaica's rich music and diverse culture which has made the current global crisis bearable for god and his patience and mercy i'm thankful for my family my immediate family at home my church family and the a family i acquired here at school that god has blessed me with thank you thank you thank you jesus i'm so grateful to you because until now nothing has happened to my family and to me and during the COVID-19 and the insecurity of the country. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. I have two unique things that I am thankful for. One is the scenery, the ocean, the greenery. We love it here. Another thing I'm thankful for is community spirit. I could go across by my neighbor and say, neighbors, I could get a pinch of salt. I could get some ketchup. Or there was a time my hand was hurting me and I asked my neighbor for a piece of wonder of the world leaf to put on my wrist that I will feel better. And this is what I am most grateful for. My Trinidad and Tobago, we love it here. Hi, my Lehigh family. I'm going to take this moment to tell you guys how thankful I am. I'm so thankful, even though that we've been having such a rough year this year so far, 
But I'm just thankful that we've been able to spend more time at home with our families, doing things around the house that we never really get to do. So just spending more time together. I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful that we're all healthy and safe. And I hope you are too. Love you. Miss you. Bye. So you see, it doesn't matter where in the world you're from, we all have something to be thankful for. Here's an opportunity where we can all participate in our annual Thanksgiving offering on December 5th. This will go towards our building fund. You can submit your offering to our PO Box 625 Lehigh Acres, Florida, or you could simply submit it online. Let's stay in the mindset of daily Thanksgiving. There are two ways you can use the Adventist Giving Platform. The first one is online. Go to www.adventistgiving.org. Once you get to the welcome page, you will see an input field where you can type the name of your church. Once you begin typing the name of the church, a drop-down menu will appear with a short list of churches that best match your entry. It is very important that you select the correct church. One way to verify if you have the correct church is by the address shown. Once you select the church, you will be taken to the donation page that resembles the familiar tithe envelopes you see in church each week. Here, you will see the areas that you can choose to designate your monies for, such as tithe, local church budget, Sabbath school expenses, etc. The virtual envelope is separated by sections for local church, conference and union, and world. At the bottom of each section, you will see the phrase more offering categories. Here, you can click and a pop-up window will display a list of other options for you to select to add to your virtual tithe envelope. Once you are done, you click the Back to Envelope button. Once you make your selections of where you want to donate, you input the amount next to the dollar symbol by each specific area. If you choose more than one category, it will automatically total your donation at the bottom of the page. Once you are finished designating your funds, click Continue. This will take you to the next page, where you will have the option to log in, register, or continue as a guest to make your donation. We recommend registering if you are a first-time user. That way, your profile information and payment will be saved to make it easier for future use. The second method you can give online is through the Adventist Giving app via your smartphone. First, you must download the Adventist Giving app from the App Store or Google Play. Once you do, open the app. The initial page will tell you more about Adventist giving and the features of the app. You will be prompted to slide to the right until you see the option to select your church. Once you select your church, you will see the options with the same sections and categories as the website. The main difference is that at the top, just below your listed church, you will see the option for a one-time donation or a recurring donation, which you can select to set up automatic payments. Follow the instructions and input where you would like your monies to go, and the total will be automatically calculated at the end, just like the website. Continue to follow the instructions listed and you will be on your way to successfully donate it via the ease of your smartphone. For a list of frequently asked questions, please visit floridaconference.com forward slash Adventist giving.
<laughs> Good morning, boys and girls, and welcome to Sabbath School. The title of our story today is called A Recipe for Happiness, The Beatitudes. Our story comes from Matthew 1, verse 1 to 12. Well, today we are going to fix a tasty snack. Oh, that sounds like fun. The first thing we need is a recipe. Do you know what a recipe is? A recipe is a set of instructions, including a list of all the ingredients. I have a recipe to make a delicious and healthy trail mix. And here are the trail mix ingredients. We need a bowl, and this is where we will mix it. So here I have some Chex Mix, some peanuts, and some pistachios. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to pour some Chex Mix into our bowl. And next, we're going to put our pistachios into the bowl. And last, we're going to put our peanuts into the bowl. And the last thing we're going to do is mix it so we have our crumbs. So now we have a tasty snack we can enjoy later. Did you know that Jesus gave us a recipe for living a happy life? In the book of Matthew, the Bible says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and began to teach them. He taught them a lesson we call the Beatitudes. Each one of the Beatitudes start with the word, Blessed are they. Some translations of the Bible use the word happy instead of blessed. So this is Jesus' recipe for us to be happy. I like that the word beatitude has two parts to it, be and attitude. The beatitudes are ways that we can be and attitudes we can have. Let's look at a few of these beatitudes Jesus said to. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they'll be shown mercy. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and say all kind of evil things about you falsely on account of me. Rejoice and be glad because your reward is great in heaven for they persecuted the prophets before you in the same way. I like that Jesus gave us a recipe for how to be and what kind of attitudes to have. And Jesus says that we will be happy if we follow his recipe. Boys and girls, let us pray. Dear God, thank you for the beatitude. Please help us follow your recipe for a happy and blessed life. 
Help us to be good boys and girls and be obedient to others. Help us to have a good Sabbath. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome to another inspirational moment, the brighter side of COVID. Just flip it and you will find it. Today's segment is entitled Recovery Part 10. And so we turn the page from the darker side of COVID and shine the light on the brighter side of celebrity recovery. On November 10, 2020, Richard Schiff announced that he and his wife, Sheila Kelly, had tested positive for COVID-19 on election day and were quarantined at their home in Vancouver, Canada. At the time of the COVID attack, 260,000 people had already died. He was extremely concerned about his condition. Given the reality of the pandemic, on the following Monday, he announced he was hospitalized showing some improvements while Sheila, his wife, was at home doing better. Richard Schiff is a close friend of Lawrence Adana and as well as the cast of West Wing fame. In a conversation with Lawrence, he shared and reflected on his fears and his concerns while hospitalized. Things had become very serious. He described his illness in stark terms. This thing, he says, is binary. It wants to beat you. It gets into every part of your system. This thing will debilitate you. It doesn't want you to breathe. It doesn't want you to have energy. My energy is gone. My strength is gone. My legs are atrophy. You, you don't want this, he says to his friend. I had taken every precaution. But then again, it still hit me. So I want to advise people, he says, to do all you can to keep it at bay and help others keep it at bay. He spoke of having a conversation with his wife, which he said, it is not a conversation you want to have. For her part, his wife, Sheila, characterized the whole experience as, quote, it's like walking away from the sun. That's the darker side of COVID. Richard Schiff praises the care he received in the Vancouver General Hospital in Canada. He characterized the nurses and doctors and support staff as caring, loving, very good, efficient, clean, and fantastic. He reported to Lawrence that he came out of there, meaning the hospital, without a debilitating bill. They do not discriminate against you, he said. Although I was not a citizen, everyone is treated the same. After 13 days, on November 19, Richard Schiff was released from the hospital on his way to full recovery. Richard Schiff says that you and I must learn to appreciate people you love because you may not be there next week. Whenever you go through a crisis, you realize how much the people you love mean to you and those who love you mean to you, and you don't take it for granted. That's precisely the brighter side of COVID. Let's keep on flipping it. Each time you flip it, you will find it. It will put a smile on your face and bring warmth to your heart. So until next time, let's keep on flipping. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Brittany. I am very excited to be a part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. My favorite scripture in the Bible is Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5. It gives me hope in the Lord and it makes me feel protected by Him. I don't have a favorite hymn yet, but my favorite song is Waymaker. Because the words to the song give me strength and describes how much God loves us and everything he will do for us, we just need to have faith in him. The reason I wanted to be baptized was to unify myself with the Lord and pledge my life to be a servant for him. I was battling depression, anger, and anxiety before accepting Jesus as my Savior. Hopelessness and the need for a better life brought me to him. If anyone needs love in their life and peace, please come to the Lord. He will fill that empty space with so much love, it will change you forever. Thank you. Heavenly Father, our God in heaven, Father, we're before you once again. Come, We come rejoicing, O oh God. I come rejoicing on behalf of your people because there is one who has made a decision for Jesus Christ. Brittany May has realized that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of her life. And she, she desires to show the world through baptism today. So, Father, as she goes into the watery grave, O oh God, as she arises, I pray that your Holy Spirit will be upon her. Father, may your presence continue to be with her, O oh God. I pray that your light will shine upon her way, that she may see clearly as she walks this journey. This journey, O oh God, in a, in a world where things are difficult and can be dark. But I pray, Father, that you may strengthen her, that your Spirit will continue to be with her. I pray, O oh Lord, that the Lehi family will continue, will, will stand with her as well, continue, lift her up in her time of need. I thank you also for those who have worked with her, for those who have presented Jesus Christ to her, presented the gospel to her, the ones who have, have presented, the, who have answered the call of the Great Commission, O oh Lord, and have taken Jesus Christ to the world. So thank you once again, O oh Lord, for Brittany, a life. A life that has decided that she wants to walk with Jesus Christ. A life unto salvation. And I pray God that she may continue to hold fast and to hold strong. Holding on to your unchanging hand. May you bless her. May you bless her family. I pray, O oh God, that you may just continue to be a presence in her life. May she continue to feel your warmth, O oh God. May she always feel your love. And Father, may she always feel the strength of your power. May she feel your glory oh, because you are God. You are her God. And Father, she has decided that there is none other. So Lord, may you continue to bless her. And now I pray, walk with her along the way. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Heaven rejoices with the Lehigh Seventh-day Adventist Church as we welcome into fellowship by baptism, Brittany May. Her favorite scripture is Proverbs 30, verse 5. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Her favorite song is Waymaker. You are here, moving in this place. I worship you. I worship you, you are here, turning lives around, I worship you. I'm so delighted to have Sister Brittany May in the pool today. Sister Brittany, I bless you for the path that you have chosen and for the decision you have made to follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Heaven listened to the voice of the Lord. So, Sister Brittany, upon the profession of your faith and your belief in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior from sin, we now baptize you in the name of the Father 
and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let the church say, Amen. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Please let us know how we can pray for you by call or text to 941-876-8005. 941-876-8005. O Lord and our God, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your grand and holy name, Lord Today, it is my privilege to come before you on behalf of your people because, Lord, we need a word from you. Father, we need a touch from you. Lord, in times like these, we need our Savior. Father, in times like these, O oh Lord, Father, is when we need the creator of this universe to, to hear our prayers and to answer as we call upon your, your, your holy name today. Father, there are many of us who are challenged in these times. Lord, the world is a difficult place to navigate, but Father, your word have told us that these times would come. So Father, we're looking up today because we know that redemption draws nigh. But Father, until then, Lord, we seek to stand, stand upon your name, upon the name of Jesus Christ, to stand upon the sacrifice that was made on Calvary's cross, that we may live in victory. Father, today we seek victory from illness. Father, we seek victory from pain. We seek victory from suffering, O oh God. We seek victory from fear. Father, we seek your victory today. So Father, I pray that the peace from heaven will be upon your people today, O oh God. That Father, that we may, we may be able to separate ourselves from, from the issues of this world and, and, and be reminded that you are on the throne. And as long as you're on the throne, we have nothing to fear. Reminding us that Jesus Christ has already won the battle. And all we have to do is accept and believe. So Father, today I come on behalf of the saints, oh God. I come on behalf of each and every one, oh God, who, who, are here, who hears my voice. That we may learn to accept and to believe. Remind us, oh God, I pray. Remind us. May your presence be with us. May we feel your warmth, O oh God. May the light of your presence be upon us today. And Father, I come also in thanksgiving, thanking you for what you have done for us, thanking you for what you are doing today, and thanking you for knowing that we can, we can trust in you and that we can believe that you will continue to act on our behalf as we go from day to day. So Father, it is great being in your presence, O oh Lord. I pray that you will touch Touch someone today. Touch a life today, O oh God. May your Holy Spirit move amongst us, I pray. And Father, may your joy be within our hearts because we know that we're in the presence of the Almighty God. So Father, I pray that today you will heal. I pray that today you will comfort. I pray today you will reassure somebody, O oh God. I pray that today you may, you, 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 you may give us your provision. Give us your protection. Be God to your people. Father, we desire different things, but you're a God who can provide all things. So, Father, we worship your name today, recognizing that you are the one true God, the way, the truth, and the life. So, Lord, I ask that you accept our worship. Thank you so much for being God to us. And, Lord, I pray that you may continue to bless your people as we lift up our praises unto you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Much faster than the blink of an eye.
Happy Sabbath, everyone. Welcome to the Lehigh service again today. We are happy that you joined us. I want to begin by first extending my congratulations to Sister Brittany May. I not only congratulate her, but I welcome her into the fellowship of the Lehigh Seventh-day Adventist Church. We are proud of the step that you took in baptism, which we just witnessed today. Also, heartiest congratulations to our young sister, Lashana Hamilton, who was sworn in as an attorney at law for the United States on Monday of this week. Lashana was one of Sister Hoylet's mentees amongst our youth in the church, and I, of course I know that she would have been very proud of you. I congratulate also the Hamilton family for uh, what you have wrought in Lashana's life. And of course, I know my little friend Liani is very proud of her mother today. Today we begin our mini-series, or rather we continue our mini-series on going home. This is our home stretch on our year's theme, Heavenly Living on Earth. Our scripture reading is to be found in Romans chapter 13, verses 10 to 14. Let's take our Bibles together and our phones and let's read this together. Verse 10. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling goal of the law. And that knowing the time, that it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is your salvation nearer than when we believed. Verse 12, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Verse 13 says, let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. In that verse, when it says, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, we must be thinking right now about the clothing of character. The sermon text itself is to be found in the Old Testament, the book of Zechariah, chapter 4 and verse 6. Here's what it says. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, Say the Lord of hosts. My sermon topic is high time. High time. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, help us to recognize time. Lead us now into an understanding of what it means to face high time. And may we know, Lord, what your will for us today is as you speak through your word and through your servant according to your will. In the name of Jesus, I ask, let the church say, Amen. Tell somebody, I need some new clothes. Husbands and wives are watching me now. Wives, tell your husband, I need some new clothes. And husbands, you might want to tell your wives the same thing. I need some new clothes. And if you're single and you have no husband to talk to or no wife to talk to, just, just tell your children, I need some new clothes. And if you have no children, then talk to God. Tell him, I need some new clothes. He will understand, I guarantee you. Today's sermon is connected with last Sabbath's message on wake-up calls. I mentioned then that I would not speak on the time aspect of the text, but would only focus on the sleep portion of the text and the importance of awaking out of sleep. So today I will address the time context and there is in respect to going home. The context of time will directly focus 
on a sign of the times, not in a manner that we have done before or always done when we preach this text. We're not speaking about all the different signs of the times that have been articulated in the Bible. We're speaking about one type of sign today, the increase of knowledge and the current stage of scientific development. That's what we will focus on. I shall also address the current state of our individual being in context of high time. When I was growing up, I learned the phrase, time waits for no man. I believe that some of you also learned that phrase too. There were quite a number of exhortations which included either the messages of the urgency of time or a referential note regarding the importance of it. Let's go. Time is running out. There's not enough time for that, so come on. Please meet me on time. We have, no, we have to start on time. Uh, We're going to be there uh, on time, will you? Uh, it's a good time for you. Is that a good time? Time is money. Time is tempest fugit. A stitch in time saves nine. The wise man Solomon gave us a litany of wisdom on the subject of time. A time to live and a time to die. There's a time for everything under the sun. The poets joined the drumbeat of time in tandem. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and depart and leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. William Camden uh, put it this way, he that had time and looks for time loses time. Think about that one. Uh, English Chaucer po uh, proverb puts it together, time and tide waits for no man. Samuel smiles in his writing, penned these words in, in his writings of self-help in 1859. Those who have most to do and are willing to work will find the most time. All these teachings we received in our early years, we have transmitted them to our children from generation to generation. So children today may even recognize some of those sayings. Probably among the most significant biblical reference to time, though, is in the New Testament, which firstly uh, meets us with like a, a, a hammer to the, to the pedal. The Apostle Paul is the one who calls our attention to it in this chapter 13 of Romans. And that, knowing the time, that it is high time, <laughs> Paul bids us to focus on what he calls high time. Follow me closely. The terminology in this root word here does not refer to time in general, rather it refers to time in a definite, measured, and fixed time, or to a critical period or season. Mark the distinction. Paul had just given an extensive sermon on lifestyle in chapter 12. We will reflect on that content later on in the message. But he begins chapter 13 by speaking to the issue of power and how the brethren should relate to such in context of ministry, noting that there is no power but of God and no power on earth except such as as ordained by God. And you'll see that when we come back around to our sermon text. He then seeks to develop the concept of obedience and lifestyle a bit more, seeking to have tribute and customs and awe and honor receive their respectful place among the saints. He then advances critical spiritual thinking about it by encouraging love of neighbor as of self. Well, verse 10 of Romans 13 certifies what he intended to communicate as an underpinning of the Christ-following life. Yea, says he, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Paul is laying a foundation for his critical message. It is at this juncture that Paul presents the critical conclusive phase of the time to which all Christ's followers strive. He says, 
and that, knowing the time. The believers in Rome, as well as in Corinth, were being admonished that the time was short and that knowing the time should pull deeply on the heartstrings of the Christ followers in Rome. And that knowing the time, the injunction meant that decisions for Christ were urgent. And now it is high time to, to awake meant decisions for change were critical. For now is our salvation nearer. Decisions for commitment were crucial. In his reference to high time, one sense is a type of open anxiety, if not frustration with the brethren. Paul was actually having problems with the Judaizers who had been expressing doubt about Jesus Christ and the gospel. So Paul pressed the notion that because they knew the times in which they were living, it was high time for them to awake out of their varying levels of slumber disinterestedness, inattention, a weakness and slowness about the gospel message. Scholars who study this text, they assert that the believers in Rome could not be more aware of the critical time in which they live. Therefore, Paul urges them to cast off their works of darkness, their lukewarmness, their indolence, their self-indulgence, and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, it was unquestionable that the desire for change and the desire to change their garb, their clothing of, of Christ, would engage ultimate readiness to which he provided a capstone for his message. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Are you ready to put on new clothes? That's the issue in the message of Paul. Here is the capstone of Paul's message. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the arm of light. So Paul is talking to us today. So let's talk about it. When you look around you, when you experience the changing of times and lifestyles before your very eyes, are we caught up in the new reality of living? And as we are caught up in that new reality, as we find ourselves on the edges of Alex Huxley's, uh, Huxley's Brave New World, which hit the bookshelves and universities 50 years ago, in which he conceived of a world 600 years down the road of drugs everywhere, cloning, the stratification of human species, and so on. As you look around, are we not all for all practical purposes in Huckley's world today? When you contemplate the movement of earthly time in view of biblical history and yea, prophecy, the question becomes, what therefore is your concept of Paul's injunction as it relates to your life? and to mine personally. Hmm. This is serious. This is an issue of readiness. As we're caught up with the realities of living around us. Huxley, 50 years ago, was the first one to push the envelope on this. Well, 35 years ago, Dr. Richard Rice, in his book, The Reign of God, took time to set a stage for the doctrine of last things the roots of Adventist eschatology, if you please. Dr. Rice approached his argument for the timeliness of Christian eschatology by having his readers contemplate a few relevant yet futuristic questions. I was intrigued with the questions and, and so I'll posit some answers. Where is history going, he asked. Well, sir, History is going exactly in the direction that biblical prophecy predicted. What will life be like in 10, 20, or 50 years from now? Rice is speaking about this back in 1985. Well, sir, we have evolved from a large mainframe computer to managing every aspect of our lives from the palm of our hands, and we're not done yet. 
Yeah, we have moved from that old rotary pay phone to an iPhone. We manage our buying and our selling uh, from something we call our galaxy. And by the way, that's not in the sky. It's also in our hands. But I got to tell you, we use the cloud for a storehouse instead of the building on the back of the house. What will people eat? We're eating more healthy, you'd be happy to know, but we are doing it by ordering in and taking out. We throw in some fruits, some grains, some nuts to make it right. What will people wear, he asked. As for what we are wearing, some of us hardly wear much of anything at all. Uh, but be not dismayed, others of us are holding on as much as possible to all the material we can put together. BTW, we can hardly find the functional sewing machine at home anymore to do our own sewing. If you understand what I mean by BTW, sir, that's our new language. How will people work, you ask? Well, Dr. Rice, we are working from home now. When we leave to go to work, we go home. And when we come home from work, we find that we're already there. Some of us have made it so we just move from room to room. Or better yet, our office is right there with us in the kitchen. We just share the table desk and have dinner right there on it. So we eat at work and we work in the kitchen. Ah, you might not understand that, Dr. Rice. But let's move on. You ask, what will entertainment be like? Ah, well... Entertainment is easy. We switch from channel to channel by speaking into our remote control on our smart televisions to anything we want to see or to do or even to exercise. Oh, we play, we, we, we play with our, with our television sets. We really enjoy ourselves playing what we call virtual games. And no, we don't really go to the bowling alley anymore. We just do it in our family room. Ah, uh, yes, basketball and tennis too. We force ourselves out when we get bored or just need fresh air. BTW. Oh, that, there goes that lettering again. Oh, we don't get up from our comfortable couches to switch anything, uh, any buttons on or off on our television anymore. Ah, how many children will our average family have? Well, Dr. Rice, as for children, our families feel fine settling with an average of two, not in your day when they had eight, nine, and ten. Well, well, what will an average family look like, you ask? Yes, there is an average family. It is one parent family these days. Or two parents of the same sex. I know you wouldn't understand that because you're from the olden days, you see. How long will people live? Well, people are living longer in some places. They're mostly people of faith, people of values, and that's good news. Ah, yes, just, I just attended a 100-year birthday party this week. Guess what it took place, uh, what it took place uh, on. It's called Zoom. 300 people got together on Zoom. We could see everybody. We could talk. We could laugh with each other, and we were not even in the same place. Hmm. Ah, Dr. Rice, I can't explain that to you in such a short time. But I go on to your next question. What will people die from? Well, people are dying from what is called COVID-19. It's what you read about in the Bible called a pestilence. Will the nations of the world achieve peace, you ask? As for the nations of the world achieving peace, the jury is still out on that because from the time of Rumpelstiltskin, they're still going to war in order to find peace, Dr. Rice. Well, your last question, will human beings annihilate themselves? Oh, as for human beings annihilating themselves, I am hoping, Dr. Rice, that Jesus comes soon before the humans get done with that project. They're on it. Ladies and gentlemen, the questions back then, 35 years ago, drove to the heart of the nature and times that we will be living in today and beyond. We have 15 years to go on Rice's litany of insightful questions. 
Rice was forward thinking. He says that human beings have made great strides in many areas, but getting along with each other is not one of them. Neither is taking proper care of the environment. Technology has brought us many good things, but it has pushed us to the brink of disaster, is what he said back then, 35 years ago. The questions Rice asked were connected with future threats of technology, which 35 years later have become today's world of reality. That's what I meant when I said when you're caught up in reality, as you look around in your reality, how do you fare with respect to yourself as a Christ follower? Time. Time is proven to be an element that we face with temerity and excitement all at the same time. Let's take a peek into science to see what will happen by 2030 and beyond. Let's see what technology and science is doing. This might astound both us and the Dr. Rice. There's a doctor by the name of Dr. Mitru Kaku, a distinguished professor of the City University of New York. He's a theoretical physicist known for his string field theory. Star Trek, beam me up, Scotty, and energy fields provided a backdrop for understanding with his audience to whom he spoke. Speaking at the Queensborough College, New York recently, uh, just a few weeks ago, his presentation focused on science and the future. He said that in the future, current science fiction technology will become real in the future. He spoke of the impact of technology on the future. He managed the world, he, Im he imagined the world in 2020, 2040, 2060, 30 years and beyond in the future. As a point of reference, Dr. Kaku indicated that physicists created the laser, created the transistor, created the TV, uh, created, uh, uh, discovered, invented is what I mean to say, discovered the microwave, wrote the World Wide Web. In 1901, no one could imagine flying from Chicago to Europe in a few hours, he said. But Dr. Kaku gave his audience a guided tour, therefore, of the future, referenced in his book and the current sci-fi science series, weekly television series, which began on December 1, based on his book, The Physics of the Impossible. Note the title, The Physics of the Impossible. He interviewed 300 of the world's top scientists, whom he says are inventing the world's future. Listen to me carefully today. I'm talking about a sign of the time, just one. Just one that is encompassed, encompassed in scientific development. So he spoke of what is known as Moore's Law. He said computer power doubles every 18 months. The chip in a birthday card that you receive that sings happy birthday to you, that chip has more computer power than all the Allied forces of 1945 in the World War. Listen to me carefully today. Hitler, Eisenhower, Churchill, he said, would have killed to get their hands on a chip like that. Chips are being put into toys today. In the future, the future of the computer is that the computer will disappear. In the future, your cell phone will be your entire PC. The PC will disappear. He says our cell phone today has more computer power than all NASA had in the 1960s when they put men on the moon. They had almost no computer power. Oh yes, here is the physicist talking about science. Science, scientists have predicted that by the year, by this year, which was supposed to be in the future, but is now present. By 2020, they said the computer chip would cost about a penny, which is the cost of scrap paper. The computer would be everywhere and nowhere, hidden in the wall, hidden in the, in the walls of your house, hidden in the fabrics of the life of your, of your life, just like electricity is. Ah, think about it, think about it. The internet, you know, is everywhere, and the World Wide Web is everywhere. How, how, but the person that was looking around in his yard in 1901 never would have imagined where we are today. So here now, the scientists are imagining 60 years from today. How will we communicate with each other? In the future, 
Kaku who said, glasses will have full internet capability. Mm, yes, you heard him. In the future, you can download any website, any movie, email all on your glasses. In the future, your glasses can recognize people's faces whom you forgot when you met them a few weeks ago. Your glasses will remind you, that's Tom, dummy. Don't you remember? You met him a few weeks ago. And then your glasses can download at your request all the biographical uh, information you need on Tommy. Oh yes, your glasses can tell you uh, who you bump into on the street. In the future, your glasses will give you full information on him. If you don't wear glasses, physicists are now building contact lenses for internet accessibility. In the future, the internet can be flashed directly into the retina of the eye. In the future, you will have full internet capability on your glasses, on your contacts. In the future, uh, you will be fashionable. Young people will demand glasses with full internet capability downloaded when they come to pick it up as they purchase it. Imagine taking a final examination with glasses or contact lens that have internet, full internet capabilities. Teachers will be in trouble. Hmm? Hmm? It gets more exciting. Follow me carefully here. In the future, you will have a paper scrolling out <clears throat> from your phone. The paper will be intelligent and you will be able to write on it. You con your contact lenses will give you how fast you're going, how much gas you're using and how much gas you'll need. And your contacts will also be able to show you landmarks in strange places through which you drive. In the future, you will have what is known as augmented reality, not virtual reality anymore. It will be a mixture of reality with animation. So you may visit the catacombs of Rome and you're disappointed and you see just scraps of stuff around, but then you can engage your contact lenses and then it will show you a full story about the whole deal way back then and bring you forward into the future and catch up with you in the present. Yes, that's at augmented reality. Yeah, internet contact lenses. Today, today when you walk into a room, the first thing you look for at night is the light switch. But in the future, when you walk into a room, you will look for the internet portal. You will assume that the room is intelligent. Internet capability in your wall and in your wallpaper. Your files will move from, with you from room to room. You will not need the computer to move with you. The computer will only cost a few pennies, but you will walk to your wall screen and seek for a date on your computer wall, on your, on your wall, your, your wallpaper will tell you who is available for a date in college tonight. You see, you will speak to the wall screen and you can ask for a movie, any movie, and whatever movie you ask for, you can ask for the start of the change and made to be you in the future. In the future, cars will be driven without a driver, already being done now for millions of miles in the early stages of practice. In the future, you'll contend with robots. You already know that. Oh yes, the Azimo uh, robot can run, can walk, can climb stairs, can dance. It is the most advanced robot. Right now, it takes six hours to walk across the room. In the future, Azimo type robots will be nurses. Yeah, you're listening to me, aren't you? Robots are being programmed to create nurses for the Japanese aging society, the aging population in Japan. They're making a lot of robots to work as nurses for them. That is the future of nursing, not of intelligence. In the future, there will be a phenomenon known as invisibility. Duke University have invented the world's first invisibility microwave device, Donald. It will make the item invisible to a microwave. University of Berkeley and Caltech University are also working on invisibility. At Brown University, a stroke victim has a chip placed in his brain, hooked up to a laptop from a dock in his brain. The paralyzed man can read, he can do emails, he can search the web, he's paralyzed. But this is the world's first direct link 
between a human brain and a computer. Yes, in the future, scientists may be able to photograph and record your dreams. Way beyond all of that. Way beyond all of that. In what is being referred to as the very far future. Beyond this 60-year uh, confine that we just revealed. The scientists conceive of the probability of building, yeah, you got it, a starship. Starship, full time, in the future. And in the future, health bringing it closer back to home. In the future, health will be turned upside down. And now they grow noses. In the future, DNA chips will be scattered in your bathroom for constant analysis of DNA. DNA chips will scan in a matter of minutes. In the future, it will only cost $100 to scan your genome DNA system. That is many, many years far in the future. This will be your owner's manual, DNA on a CD-ROM. In the future, only five years hence in the future, bringing it back closer, they will grow a liver. They're now already growing ears and bone and blood and skin and bladder, cartilage and a windpipe. All of this information was packed into Dr. Kalku's address at Queensborough in New York just a few weeks ago. Does this alarm you? Does the biblical prophecy that knowledge shall increase as the end draws near make new sense to you today? Is there cause to be concerned? Will man take things over from your God? Who is in control? Is, your, is our consciousness aroused to the concept of high time? For us to awake out of our sleep? Let me connect the concept with Zachariah's experience in Zechariah 4 verse 1. It is that of being awakened out of his sleep by an angel. I told you last week that somehow sleep is connected in some of these stories with the matter of waking up for eternity and for salvation and for the Lord to come full, full focus in our thinking. An angel talked to me. Zechariah 4.1 and the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. And the angel asked him, what seest thou? He answered that he looked and saw a candlestick. You remember what I told you about the candlestick last week. The legitimacy of an accredited authority of God that he has placed upon his church. Here, Zechariah was made to see the perfection of all the symbolisms, the seven lambs and the seven pipes on top of the candlesticks. The church and the promise of Christ's return was held in high regard. That's what that represented. The Christ's return. Christ is coming back soon, ladies and gentlemen. Christ is soon to come. That's why the message is urgent. High time. In verse 3, he saw two olive trees uh, standing in the right and on the left of a bowl. Then Zechariah asked the angel, What are these, my Lord? What are these? The angel answered him, questioning him, Knowest not thou what these be? And Zechariah said, No, my Lord. Seems like what we might be asking ourselves today. Lord, what's going on in our world? What are these? What are these things we're hearing? What are we seeing here? And our Lord says to us, Knowest not thou what these things be? Zechariah says, No, my Lord. And then he answered and spake unto me, saying, Here is Zechariah telling us what the angel told him. And here's what I want us to hear from God today. This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Somebody ought to say amen. I chose that brief narrative to tell you that man will not outsmart God. It is in his hands. It is in the hands of a good God to allow how far man should and can go in his inventions and in his discoveries. This is but a sign of the times. This is now high time, ladies and gentlemen. And so the angel tells us today that no accomplishment for the kingdom of God is going to be achieved through human genius. No, no, Dr. Kaku, no. Not through human ingenuity. Not 
No, not through human discovery. No, not through human invention. No, not through any attempt to recreate the creation story. No, it will not be by kingly degree or by human declaration. No, 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 not by earthly potentate shall the end of the world be managed. Human increase of knowledge as a sign of the time serves only to tell us of the high time upon which we shall come as a signal for our readiness in preparation for going home. Are you listening to me today? Yeah, 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 knowledge shall increase so that the wonders of God's creative power shall intrigue the mind of man. But ah, better yet, well, better yet and greater still is the sign of the coming of the Lord when the earth shall be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. Oh yeah, old times go up against modern times. And in truth and in fact, none of our times really matter anymore ladies and gentlemen, because we're now caught up into what I call other times. Other times. Old times are a reference. Facing off with modern times probably only serve us to offer some comic relief. That is if we have learned to place emphasis on the right things and not take ourselves too seriously. Values of the past in conflict with values of the present, and that's why Huxley's book is so dangerous. Right facing off with wrong to the confusion of our children. Who to respect, what to regard, and why give honor to any at all? What questions deserve to be asked, and what answers need to be given? I hope you're thinking with me today, yet that context is precisely a scenario which is set to come into our lives. As you and I look around in these times and both observe and consider the developing scenes in our world, we're called to attention by God himself. As well-thinking Christ followers, we must be open to fact that there are those who are of the disposition to accept signs as a mere, as more intriguing a phenomena over the biblical fundamental record. That there is a haste not to discover that the two disciplines of science and religion can find support with and for each other. That there is the reluctance to accept the creative power of God placed. The materials he gave us to use. How he placed that power in materials for and from which all scientific knowledge and inquiry find its basic origins. Yeah, 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 your creator and mine, your creator and mine will not allow creator and creatorship in this force of all invention and discovery to overrun him. Are you listening to me today? Science is a sign of high time. As is Paul's conflict with the Judaizers of Rome, so is our conflict today that of conflict with unbelievers. The theme of the book of Romans is God's provision of universal grace to combat the universal sinfulness of men and women. The legalistic culture of Rome leads them to think that they can keep God's law within the ambit of that rubric. But alas, Paul's message is that such an approach is doomed to failure inasmuch as it may be evidence of the arrogance and self-righteousness in failure to recognize man's weaknesses and his need for the Savior. Ah, Paul seeks to have the Romans accept the love of Jesus, his sacrifice on Calvary, by faith and faith alone. So Paul's urgency... Paul's urgency is the nearness of the coming of Christ. And now Paul is drawing, drawing us towards cleaning things up in our own lives in order to achieve a readiness for you and me today. I want to help Paul tighten up some nuts and bolts for Christ's following right now. Daniel Hayes and Scott Duval puts the thought together in Sussex form. I love it. Hear me clearly and reach for your pen and paper. I have a habit of doing that because it helps me to focus and line things up that I have to do. 
So writing things down, you may need to write something down right now. Writing things down also helps me to remember. My brain senses it and records it better after my eyes see it, having written it down. It all works together. Let's rivet some things of importance on being ready to go home. So follow me closely here. I'm going to break it down on the two categories for you in relating to others and two in relating to self. One in relating to others and two in relating to self. Paul speaks to us in clarity all over chapter 12 directly. The apostle is speaking to the Romans and he uses a statement of direct urgency when he said, are you ready with your paper and pen? When it comes to love, be devoted to one another. This is not rocket science. When it comes to love, be devoted to one another. Husband and wife, hear me out today. Number two, when it comes to honor, put others first, ladies and gentlemen. Number three, when it comes to zeal, don't be lazy. Uh, be set on fire by the Spirit and serve the Lord. Number five, in your hope, rejoice. In your afflictions, persevere and endure. In your prayer, persist and stay faithful. In being a neighbor, share with God's people. Ah, in your ministry, look for ways to show hospitality. I know that might have been too quick for you to write down, but you'll have the tape to go back and look at it. Are you listening to me today? Get ready, get ready, somebody. Tell somebody, I need some new clothes. And I'm not done yet. Now let's look closer into self. Live in harmony. Have a good attitude. Be in sync with yourself. Ah, I call that self Synergy. Have internal consistency. That's number two. Have a self-regulator. That's number three. Use your conscience to your benefit so you don't blow yourself up. You need a self-regulator. Number four, don't be proud. Don't think too highly of yourself. Be humble. Be careful not to brag like my fellow adult college student who came up to us, a group of young men, one day talking, and he said, gentlemen, I want you to know that I am proud of my humility. Oh, we had a joke for months after that. Number five, do not be conceited, not wise in your own eyes. That was a closer look at self. All this is what I call high time behavior. Paul offers us great counsel as we relate to others who are like the Judaizers who have not yet come to faith in Jesus Christ. As we get ready to go home, as we clean things up, as we tighten nuts and bolts of Christ following, Paul says, and still in chapter 12, four negatives are matched with four positives as Hayes and, and Duval breaks it down in their exposition of these Pauline chapters to the Romans. And as to us today, listen, he says to them, instead of cursing, we should bless. Number two, instead of paying, repaying evil for evil, we should do what is right and as far as is possible, live peaceably with all men and women. Number three, don't avenge for yourself. Leave that avenging for God to accomplish. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. And in that context, God will take care of your business for you. You can't touch that when God is handling it. Ah, ah, all of this is high time behavior. Are you listening to me today? Tell somebody, I need some new clothes. Yes, I need to be on fleek. I need to be slay. I need some new clothes. I need to be perfect, on point, and awesome in the Lord. Yea, 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 ladies and gentlemen, in these last days, our focus ought to be on loving one another in specific and definitive ways, as Paul just outlined. Our readiness depends on it. We are right now in the process of being saved. Watch the progression. We have been saved by virtue of our acceptance of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on Calvary for the remission of our sins. That is justification. We are being saved daily through his righteousness, by his grace and our faith. That's sanctification, which is the work of a lifetime. And we shall be saved when he comes a second time to take us home. Then shall we receive his robe of righteousness. All of this is high time behavior. 
Yeah, yeah, it's high time to wake out of our slumber and our sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The significance of God's sensitivity to time is seen in Galatians 4.4. God is a God of time. He declared it in Galatians. And Bible says, but when the fullness of time had come from the outset of salvation, God was on time. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son to save us, born of a woman. And here we see God operating in the fullness of time, on the nick of time, and in the precision of time. God is all about time, and then in full coordination with beginning time, he connects it with end time. So in Mark 1, 15, we read, saying, the time is fulfilled, ladies and gentlemen, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. We not only believe the gospel by reading it and accepting it, ladies and gentlemen, we do that by living it, by putting on Jesus Christ, putting on new clothes. And then again in Ephesians 1.10, speaking of time, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on the earth. Yes, God has outlined time and God has lined up time in order to bring us into a recognition and to culminate in high time. Are you listening today? Since the day of Christ, since the day of Christ is almost near, you and I should behave as if we are indeed the children of light rather than the children of darkness. That involves the clothes we wear. Yea, we ought to behave like people who are about to see the Lord's return. Ask somebody, you know what I'm talking about. Somebody ought to shout. Tell somebody, I'm putting on my new clothes now. I'm putting on my new clothes now. It's time for my new clothes. Yeah, 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 Paul seals the end of the chapter 13 by exhorting us to dress up for the journey. Yeah, he says, let us put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a dress of character. Dress up, get ready. Dress up, let's walk honestly as in the day. Dress up, no riotous living. Dress up, no drinking. Dress up, no wantonness. Dress up, no chambering. Dress up, no strife. Dress up, no envying. Dress up, no provision for the flesh. Dress up, get ready, get ready, get ready. Dress up. Let us put on the character of Christ. Dress up. It is high time. Let me tell you, God functioned on time. God is on point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All God's children need to be ready for high time appearance. Dress for success. Talk about being on fleek. Talk about being slay. This is our moment. This is our moment. I want to ask you to do something today that I have not asked you to do before. In this moment, I want to imagine that you're in church, you're in the building. And so I'm going to ask everybody to stand where you are in your house as if you're in church. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you a minute. I'll give you a minute to change your cozy position from lounging and lying down on the couch or from lying in bed. Just stand up for a moment. Let's get to practicing as if we are in church for the call. The altar call in church. But, but this time you're not going to an altar. You're not going to stand before the pulpit. Ladies and gentlemen, this time you're, you're really standing before God. There is no pulpit. There is no pastor standing in the pulpit. You're standing before God. I'll give you a couple more seconds as you stand in your place at home right now. Yeah, I'm beseeching you, if you understand that it is high time that you create that posture of readiness as you're dressed up by putting on Jesus Christ. You're standing, you're standing, you're standing, you're standing. I have just one question to ask before I have you to sit back down. Here is the question. It is simple. Are you ready to go home?
Heavenly Father, as our people stand in your presence, as I stand with them today, Lord Jesus, I pray, Lord, that we may be dressed up and ready to go. We want to be on point today in your righteousness. We want to receive your mighty robe, Lord, from you personally. Personally, I know that each one have a robe. Each one will have a robe as we stand in the presence of the kingdom of God. And I pray, God, that you will make me ready, uh, make my family ready, my children ready, my people ready, my friends ready. Oh, God, I pray that we will be ready to meet you when you come the second time. Jesus, receive us as we stand in your presence. And where we stand, wherever we are now in our homes, wherever it is that we're standing, help us to realize that that place is holy ground. Because of what's taking place right now between heaven and earth, between you and me and you and us, our wives, our children, our parents. And I ask these mercies, Lord Jesus, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Let the church say, Amen. Be seated again in your positions in the presence of the Lord. God bless you real good. Have a good Sabbath evening and a good week. It's another first ever for Lehigh SDA Church. It's our first virtual annual Thanksgiving offering. In spite of everything going on around us, global pandemic among others, we have so much to be thankful for. What are you thankful for? Greetings Lehigh SDA Church, all the way from the Bahamas. Happy Thanksgiving. During this time, I'm very thankful to God this year for keeping me safe during this time and for keeping my family safe as well. I'm thankful for life, family, and friends. I'm thankful for is one that most of our churches here in Jamaica remained open during the COVID-19 and two I am thankful for Jamaica's rich music and diverse culture which has made the current global crisis bearable. For God and his patience and mercy I'm thankful for my family my immediate family at home my church family and the a family I acquired here at school that God has blessed me with. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. I'm so grateful to you because until now nothing has happened to my family and to me and during the COVID-19 and the insecurity of the country. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. I have two unique things that I am thankful for. One is the scenery, the ocean, the greenery. We love it here. Another thing I'm thankful for is community spirit. I could go across by my neighbor and say, neighbors, I could get a pinch of salt. I could get some ketchup. Or there was a time my hand was hurting me and I asked my neighbor for a piece of wonder of the world leaf to put on my wrist that I will feel better. And this is what I am most grateful for. My Trinidad and Tobago, we love it here. Hi, my Lehigh family. I'm going to take this moment to tell you guys how thankful I am. I'm so thankful even though that we've been having such a rough year this year so far. But I'm just thankful that we've been able to spend more time at home with our families, doing things around the house that we never really get to do. So just spending more time together. I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful that we're all healthy and safe. And I hope you are too. Love you. Miss you. Bye. So you see, it doesn't matter where in the world you're from, we all have something to be thankful for. Here's an opportunity where we can all participate in our annual Thanksgiving offering on December 5th. This will go towards our building fund. You can submit your offering to our PO Box 625 Lehigh Acres, Florida, or you could simply submit it online. 
Let's stay in the mindset of daily thanksgiving.